Um, we're going to do these things, uh, have a go at various things. So we're going to have a go, first of all, at defining quality, what it means to us. And there's no right answers or wrong answers. Um, articulating what it might look like if we're going to then look for it in the classroom. Uh, I'm going to tell you two stories from research that I did a, a couple of years ago uh, about two primary school pupils, Tom and Julie, uh, and see what you make of that uh, in terms of uh, understanding quality from a child's perspective. Um, and then we're going to see if we can develop some tools and some processes that we might be able to use. So based on work that I've done before um, in a research setting, but trying to adapt that and simplify it a little bit so it's a bit easier to use in the classroom. Um, and then we're going to have a go uh, with a video that I've stolen off YouTube um, because I didn't have any other videos. But first of all, just to get a sense of uh, what we all, how we all uh, think about this, uh, this word quality. Really here what I'm talking about is, is you know, a good school uh, or a good teacher. Uh, it's that level of quality. So some people have just come in and got nice and comfortable and I'm now going to ask you all to stand up in a moment. I'm going to ask you a series of questions and I'd like you to position yourself on a line, imaginary line across this part of the room. Uh, so the answer that you see on this side of the screen is the far wall. That's the extreme view. The other opposite extreme is the other view, but you can stand anywhere in the middle. So if you're not sure, go for the right in the middle. Okay, so what do you think? Question number one, quality is easy to define. I could write you a quick definition right now. Yes, right over there. No, right over there. Anything in the middle is fine. Okay, <laughs> all going in one direction. Okay, interesting. Next question. Oh, I've gone the wrong way. Um, quality is best understood through measurements, through testing and measurements, or through experiences. So measurements, tests over there, experiences over there. You can be in the middle. You can be anywhere on the line. Okay. The purpose of education is to provide a skilled workforce, it's just a fundamental human right. You're shifting slightly around the middle. <laughs> and the last one, which we can't see because we're all standing in front, um, quality means something exceptional, something fit for purpose. So exceptional and fit for purpose. Okay, all right, thank you very much. You can all sit down again now. So I think this is a, it's a particularly tricky thing to try and define. Uh, some people find it very easy because they have a very clear view. Uh, other people find it very difficult because there are so many different ways that you can think about it. And most of us think about it in, in lots of different ways all at the same time. So it can get quite confusing. But it, I think it's fair to say there is no universally agreed on definition of what quality is, what a good school looks like, what a good teacher does. But there are some things that we agree about. And I know uh, you, you might have others to add to the list. Um, for us at Education Development Trust, we, we think a lot about these kind of things. Um, and one fundamental thing, which is always there, is that the pupils have to learn. And often we do measure that through tests in part. And, and that's okay. That's part of it. It's not everything, but it is part of it. But there's a lot more to it as well, and I think that's where we all start to perhaps disagree. Um, in some of the work that I've done, it's uh, clear to me that there's lots of different ways um, of, of thinking about quality, and they don't all agree with each other. Uh, and that can be really difficult if you're trying to interpret that and do something in your classroom. Um, so it, it causes problems, the fact that we don't have a universal uh, definition and that we, it's very difficult to find common ground, really. Um, and if you look at the literature, there's lots of gaps, there's lots of holes. So we don't really know about in-school perspectives. And the, for that, I mean the people in schools. What do teachers think it means? What do kids think it means? Uh, what do school leaders think it means? Um, we don't really understand very much. There's not much written about pupil-teacher interaction and how that 
might affect definitions of qualities, how, how those definitions might look different from other definitions. And there's a, quite a, uh, there's a few really interesting ideas of different ways of thinking about it. So I've, in the, the sort of line exercise, maybe summarized a few of the, the big um, ways of thinking about it. Um, but there are others too, and we'll explore some of those uh, over the next hour. Okay, so I'm going to take you through a few slides which um, just share some thoughts that I've had. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with all of these um, firmly still, but I think it's a, it's a platform from which we can go. So I think if you look at the literature, one way of interpreting it is this diagram. So there are lots of different types of definitions. Most people have a definition which crosses, across, you know, crosses through some of these circles. So we've got levels at the top. So that's quite a philosophical way of thinking about it. So uh, equality is exceptional or it's fit for purpose or anything in the middle. Um, responsibility is a different way of thinking about it. So it's about defining it. Well, it, it's somebody's responsibility. And we see it through that lens, which is slightly different again. Uh, values, so the aims, the purpose, the goals of education is another way, another angle at which you can look at it. And there's lots of business influence as well, which come up. And I'll, I'll go through these in a little bit more detail. Um, so the first one, levels, uh, I mean, you, this is quite a crude uh, summary, but um, we've, you could have at the top maybe the indefinable. So quality is something which actually we can't really pin it down. We can't define it um, very clearly. And a lot of people believe that. And at the other end of the spectrum, uh, the people think it, it is, there are levels, but they are definable. So maybe in the indefinable space, we've got this sort of very distinctive excellence. It's very transformative. It's very difficult to, uh, to describe that in crunchy, observable terms, perhaps. And on the more definable end of the spectrum, we've got uh, good, best, perfect, fit for purpose. So they're all different slightly, but they're all uh, in some way perhaps a little bit more outcomes focused and a little bit more quantifiable. Responsibility, we might break down a little bit like this. So accountability is one way of, of um, uh, ensuring that people are taking their responsibility seriously for quality and making sure it's happening in classrooms. Leadership is another, uh, there's kind of the torch gets shined at the leaders. You know, it's your responsibility to make sure uh, good education and good teaching happening in your school. Um, and there are various sort of ways of measuring this, obviously accountability and inspection. Um, We've got ideas about good and bad coming up all over the place here. Um, so we've got good leadership, uh, we've got good teaching, um, and there's obviously some, some links as well between leadership and accountability as well. But the idea being that um, responsibility can be in some way observed and measured. Uh, and as I said, good and bad comes up. Actually, mainly good. People talk a lot about good, uh, being able to see good things. Um, and uh, being able to see good schools, good teachers, and also good pupils. And I think the flip side of that, which isn't talked about very much in the literature, is the, the bad. So if you can see good, you can probably also see bad. And that's um, not necessarily the right way of looking at it, but it's one way that it does come up in the literature. Values. Um, it's quite hard to see the slide, isn't it? Um, so... Uh, there's some very individual angles you can think about uh, in terms of values. So it's about knowledge, it's about independence, it's about um, uh, sort of there's a moral imperative in education as well. It's a, it's a human right, it's, it's fundamental in that way. And those, those things are very much um, individual, they, they benefit the individual. There are also some uh, sociological um, values. So education is all about democracy and social cohesion and those kinds of things. And that's perhaps the, the, the reason why we're educators. And then there's the sort of market-oriented forces down the bottom there, uh, which links very much to the, the next slide. Um, so these are the kind of values, the things, uh, the various reasons that might um, be behind why we educate, the purpose of it, what we're trying to achieve. And the business influence, I think, if, you can probably guess this, um, but it really favours, you know, if you look, take a very business view of quality in education, you might be looking for things like consistency, uniformity, mass reach, um, uh, effectiveness, efficiencies, um, making sure it's very measurable, and you've got benchmarks and standards. So it's a very uh, quite crunchy way of looking at it. 
So I'm not saying that any of these are good or any of these are bad necessarily, or any are right or any are wrong, but I think this is just one way of looking at the masses of information that, that exists if you start searching for articles on quality. Um, in research that I've done previously, uh, there are also other ways that are perhaps not quite so um, commonplace in the literature, so other ways that you can think about quality. And they're sort of, uh, they don't fit very neatly in a diagram, so they're sort of in a list. <laughs> so there's a, a few people that say the adult-child relationship is really central. So if you're going to look at quality, you really need to look at that. That's, that's where education happens between these two people. Um, that actually maybe activity, what's happening, what kids experience in the class is perhaps more important than the outcomes. Uh, in, if, if you're looking for quality and trying to understand it in a different way. Um, other people that uh, really emphasize the social element of school, which I guess links a little bit to the experience and the activity as well, but that learning happens in social settings, and that has a huge influence, some people believe, on how children experience school um, and has a big impact on whether they learn or don't learn. Um, other people, uh, talk, they're very interested in the unintentional consequences of education. So if you just look, if you think about quality in the very business way, and we're looking for a sort of mass reach, efficiencies, and all those things. Yes, all of that. Um, they, this, of course, experiences can lead to better outcomes, but I think it's a, uh, in this particular moment, maybe seeing the two as, as opposites, not opposites, but that as different separate things. So you can look at it it's just for the purpose of kind of breaking down what quality might mean. Of course, it's not that simple in reality, but uh, for this exercise, I think it's thinking about experience or outcomes, trying to choose one over the other, maybe. Um, um, yeah, so the unintentional con consequences um, are perhaps just as important as the intentional ones, but uh, your, your tools for looking for quality might not capture these unless you specifically ask them to. Um, that obviously requires an un um, unconventional view of aims, so very different perhaps to what we saw on the slide earlier. And then um, a few people are quite interested in this idea of um, that actually quality is... Uh, really comes down to just being relentlessly critical. So as a teacher, as a practitioner in your classroom, you're constantly asking yourself, how did I do today? Um, or that this bit was good, that bit maybe perhaps didn't go so well, maybe I could change it. If I did it with this group, I might do it differently. And actually it's that, that's the thing for some people that indicates quality. Uh, it's that very um, relentless critical way of thinking about things. Yes. I think for people it's a combination of many of these things on this slide and the previous slides. And if you think about yourself, you probably pick some pieces and put them together. And that for you is how you see quality. I think that the distinctions here come from the, the points made in the literature. So I've just separated them out so we can see them more clearly. But I'm not saying they are completely separate in any individual, I think. We, we muddle them together to make our own definition. Yeah, yeah. And maybe we'll see a little bit of that coming out uh, in your views soon. Um, so in the research that I did previously, um, I spent uh, quite a lot of time in schools uh, asking teachers and pupils what they thought quality meant, uh, what this meant to them. So I would like you to have a guess <laughs> Okay, what did the teachers tell me was important in terms of their definition of quality? So maybe just on your tables or in small groups, twos or threes, if that's easy, just have a quick chat and then I will ask you for some ideas. So what did teachers say quality meant to them? Uh, it was a, um, uh, a collection of normal government primary schools in England. Some quite good, some not so good. 
a, a, a range of just normal primary schools. Um, uh, some large, some small, uh, normal teachers, a mixture of experience levels, some very new to the profession, some teaching for 30 more years. Okay. But there's no right answers or wrong answers, okay? So you, whatever you tell me uh, won't be right or wrong. Okay, so any ideas? Maybe I'll just pick on some tables and just shout out some of the ideas that you've had. So maybe I can pick on this table first. Any ideas? What did the teachers say quality meant to them? Okay, materials, resources, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, so you mean something like finishing the textbook, something like that. Okay, uh, can I pick on the table at the back? Uh, it might be that it should be balanced uh, uh, between all elements of education, like uh, playtime, uh, studying, uh, skills, growth of skills. Is that all? Any ideas? Any thoughts from your discussions? <laughs> <laughs> it's always happens. Uh, they talk about engagement, but then we went into an argument about standardized testing. Okay. And teachers are probably not going to give that as an answer because one of my colleagues mentioned that it's not politically correct anymore. Okay. But in reality, especially for higher grades, that's what teachers worry about because that's how they're going to be judged and the students are going to be judged. Okay, so a really interesting and varied collection of ideas there. So this is what the teachers in this study said, okay? I and mean, I'm not saying for a minute that what I'm showing you here is absolutely correct <laughs> and you know, true. This is what these people said, but it, you know, it can be many other things too. So um, the, the boxes show the, 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 the greatest number of, of times that a response was coded in a certain way. So the, the most... Um, frequently mentioned um, uh, description of quality was striving for the best. The second one was an external standard, so perhaps the standard imposed on them by the inspectorate. Um, for example, in England, that's the case. Uh, uh, the third one was exciting enrichment opportunities. So the opportunities that are not part of the standard curriculum, but the other things, the school trips, the visitors, the authors that might come to school and talk to the children, it's those things that made quality being reflective as a practitioner was the fifth, sorry, the fourth, uh, and uh, having good teaching and good staff was the fifth. Uh, the, the first one is the answer of teachers or school? Uh, teachers, yeah. So this is all the responses from teachers. But you can see overall, they mention a lot of different things. So the collective definition is huge, which is kind of, I think, what you'd expect, but quite interesting. A different way of looking at the same information is here. And don't worry too much about this, that's just the codes. This is the, the more interesting box, I think. So if you group all of those responses that we saw in the triangle into maybe try and put them into categories, perhaps this is what you might come up with. So uh, values comes out the greatest number. So perhaps their the ideas about quality are driven most by their personal values. Perhaps um, the next one, the next category is about education, provision, teaching, and pedagogy. So the day-to-day -day work uh, that they do. So that might include the exciting enrichment opportunities, good teaching, being relevant, engaging pupils, uh, teaching basic skills. You know, these are the, the sort of perhaps the, the more everyday functions. Uh, also educational structures. So the things around them, the things that they can't really control. Um, so using data and setting targets, uh, the leadership, um, goals, uh, making logical connections between year groups, the, kind of the structure of how the school is and how education is being put together. And then, interestingly, lots of um, codes also in ways of behaving uh, for the teacher themselves. Okay, so I also spoke to pupils. Uh, the pupils were age uh, four up to age uh, 10 was the oldest pupil. 
Um, and there were lots of them, and I interviewed them in groups. So uh, have again, have a discussion. What do you think the pupils said? I, by the way, I didn't ask them the question, um, what do you think quality means? Because I didn't think a four-year-old would understand this. So I phrased it in lots of different ways. You know, what do you like about school? What do you think is good about your school? You know, those kind of things. So I'll give you a few minutes to guess. Okay, so this is what they say. Are you surprised by this? <laughs> so friends is the top. Playtime, lunchtime, food, anything to do with food is next. Then we've got a chunk of subjects, so literacy and numeracy and art. And then outside and equipment uh, and teachers. You can't see that because uh, very well, but teachers at the bottom. <laughs> okay, so is that surprising in any way or is that what you expect? Yeah. I mean, I personally, I found this one a little surprising, perhaps, but, but actually when I think about it more, maybe it's not, because uh, I don't know what it's like in your schools, but in England, uh, primary school children spend all day, every day, doing literacy and numeracy, and occasionally they get to do art. <laughs> um, but there's, it's very literacy and numeracy focused. It's very heavy in that. Um, so maybe this is here because it's what they do uh, rather than what they love. I don't know. Um, Okay, so if we, uh, sorry, I keep going the wrong way. Um, if we do the same thing that we did with the teachers, uh, it comes out um, a little bit different. So uh, they, they talk a lot, uh, this is in response to the question, you know, what do you like, uh, that, that half of it. Um, they talk a lot about what they do every day. So, uh, you know, playtime, lunchtime, break time, literacy, numeracy, drawing, teachers, sports, you know, those kind of things. Uh, the social as aspects of schooling is another big category, I think, that comes out. Um, care and well-being is really important to them as well. Um, so partly that's about having their basic needs met, so being fed, <laughs> being given water. Um, but having friends and um, having siblings at school was something they talked about as well. Having an older brother or a younger brother or sister there, uh, they mentioned uh, qu quite frequently, actually. Um, and they often talked about that as giving them additional security and safety, particularly in schools which uh, perhaps the behavior wasn't as well managed as it could have been. Uh, and then, of course, the, they, they liked toys and all of the equipment that you might have and expect to see in a primary school. Uh, so this is a slightly different question, but in the same kind of area. Um, so I gave the pupils lots of opportunities to answer the question, the same question phrased in slightly different ways. So when asked to imagine a perfect school, what that would be like, um, they gave uh, a slightly different thing. They, they became quite imaginative. Um, so one of them wanted to have a school painted purple with a dolphin tank. Um, so they, they, you know, some of this was, was a little bit... Uh, out there, but um, they did talk a lot about things like having light and airy environments, uh, perhaps having a swimming pool, uh, having stairs and elevators, uh, indoor play areas and those kind of things they, they really liked as well. Um, they uh, uh, sort of, this is a bit of a catch-all, um, so some of them liked wearing uniform, some of them didn't like wearing uniform, um, some of them just said they liked their school and that's, that was the perfect one. Uh, some of them wanted a fun and happy place. They wanted animals and pets. Um, 
In the people and interactions, I think it starts to get quite interesting. So no bad kids was the, uh, the most important thing. Uh, and they were quite fright. That came out a lot, actually, across uh, a lot of the interviews. Nice teachers. Um, they also wanted the opportunity to be in charge of things. Uh, lots of friends uh, were very motivated and, and um, being kind of eager as pupils as well. Uh, and then um, activities uh, that were mentioned, you know, long breaks, having lots of playtime, uh, cooking, trips and sports. No, I didn't, but it would be interesting to know what they say. Okay, so just a little um, activity. On your table, there's a, a big-ish piece of paper or a couple of them, just to create a quick spider diagram, um, maybe work in, in if that four I think is fine, if, if there's more than four of you, maybe split into two. Uh, just do a very quick um, sketch of your definition of quality uh, as a three or a small group. Um, there's a bigger paper, yeah. Um, I probably won't ask you to share this, so just write whatever you want. Um, that might make you a bit freer to just go crazy and put down everything. So you don't have to have four. Uh, this one just has four as an example. Do you, you can put as many things as you like on your spider di diagram. Okay, I'll ask you to stop there, but there will be opportunities to add to this. Uh, whenever you want to, you can just add something to it if you feel uh, the, the need. Uh, um, we're not gonna do this activity. We're, I'm gonna keep them just on your tables and um, ask you to use them uh, a bit later. Uh, Okay, so we're going to move on now to, to think about how um, we can use our definitions of quality to try and see it happening um, with teachers and pupils and see if that uh, shapes our understanding in any particular way. Um, so I'm particularly interested in um, the interaction, looking at quality, uh, trying to understand quality a bit better by looking at the interaction between pupils and teachers. And there's a few people that have, have written on this, um, some really interesting books on this. So Andrew Pollard is one, and John Dewey, the philosopher, is another, um, who talks a lot about experience. So I'm really interested in what, you know, how do, uh, what do people say? What, what can they tell me and how can they articulate their description of quality? But then what do they do? <laughs> in the classroom, do they actually do what they say they do, or say they believe in? And then talking about that with them afterwards and seeing if, uh, if we can understand a bit more about it that way. Um, so there's a bit of a, a process, I guess. So um, uh, what I did and the, perhaps what I'm suggesting that you might try, you don't have to, you can adapt this as you, as you see fit, but what I did was talk to them, talk to a teacher, talk to a pupil, ask them lots of questions about how they see quality, how they understand their classroom, ask them to think about one pupil uh, and talk about the relationship with that individual, uh, then to watch them. And I watched them for quite extensive periods of time for days on end. Uh, and you won't have that luxury probably, but I think there's something that you can do in a much shorter period of time. And then really important is the last interview because in this bit, you make all sorts of subjective judgments about what you're seeing, all sorts of guesses about how people are feeling. Uh, and then you need to check that with them because you might have interpreted it completely wrong and they could give you a different view. So sort of interview, observe, interview is the general pattern. And we'll have a go at doing some of this in a minute. Um, okay, before we get uh, on to, to doing this, I want to tell you a couple of stories from... Um, some of the pupils that I observed. So um, 
uh, I have four, but I'm only going to tell you two today, uh, and two very different stories as well. So see what you make of these. So the first one is about a boy called Tom. Okay, Tom is not his real name, and this is not Tom, <laughs> just for anonymity. But I thought I'd give you something to look at. So Tom is eight, uh, and he is a, a student. His teacher is Mrs. Allison. All right. This is also not Mrs. Allison, and that is not her real name. Um, so I spent a number of days with them watching how the two of these people interact uh, and what goes on in their classroom. Uh, and I saw lots of different things while I was there. I saw lots of maths lessons uh, um, on 3D shapes, a French lesson, um, which was delivered by, via a CD uh, player because the teacher didn't speak French. Um, topic work, literacy, lots of guided reading, and a lot of tidying up. Uh, uh, there was also a range of whole class activities, group activities, individual activities, and you know, all of those things that you'd expect to see. Uh, the room was really large, the school was very lovely, uh, there was lots of displays on the walls, uh, and it was really uh, kind of well set out classroom really for, for lots of uh, the kind of group work and individual work that they were doing. They had lots of different areas where children could go. Um, there was a computer area in one corner, a carpet area, uh, a book corner and a reading area as well. Um, and they had lots of working wall displays. So everywhere you looked on the walls, there was lots of information that children could use as a reference point. So if they got stuck on their maths problem, they could go over to the maths wall, they could go over to the French wall and find vocabulary. And while I was there, I saw no children use the working walls. Um, there was lots of evidence on the walls as well about the rules and the expectations uh, of behavior um, of the pupils. Uh, and lots of displays about incentives. Um, so good behavior, you get points for your team, that kind of thing. And jars where you could get a, uh, a marble to collect points. And if you got enough marbles that week, collectively in your class, you'd get an extra playtime on Friday. So lots of incentives for the right kind of behavior. And lots of uh, equipment as well, lots of pencils, pens, paper, paint, all that kind of thing. Uh, but generally, I think the room was quite, um, quite friendly and in, in cozy in feel. Um, the story that emerged from Tom and Mrs. Allison um, uh, it was quite a positive one, I felt, overall, um, at least on the surface. Uh, it was a story about a boy who was able and who enjoyed what he did in class, and he had a really positive relationship with both his teacher and his peers. Um, Tom explained in his first interview that he considered himself confident and competent and Mrs. Allison agreed with that in her interview. He particularly liked maths, uh, and he thought he was very good at it. Uh, he really liked his teacher, and the, uh, he liked his teacher because she gave good explanations. He said, she explains our lessons well, and then we definitely know what to do. There was nothing he thought that could be improved. He thought learning was fun. He enjoyed all the incentives and the targets and the rewards that operated in his classroom. Um, in his pre-observation interview, he explained what he would be doing that day. So he had a clear idea of what was going on, what was expected of him uh, before he'd even got into the lesson. Uh, and his, his teacher uh, agreed with that, said that was quite common for him. Uh, Mrs. Allison uh, said that Tom was a good pupil to have in the class and that he liked everything about school. Uh, she described him as engaged, responsive, bright, willing, a team player, helpful, happy, and someone who loves to learn. She also thought he was inspiration, inspirational and a role model to others. He was described as a boy who responded well to and actively sought out opportunities for interaction in class with his teacher and with others. Uh, and this was certainly something that I saw as well. He often sought contact with other people even when he wasn't supposed to. Uh, Mrs. Allison described their interactions positively using phrases such as, he tends to bounce off me and we work well together as teacher and pupil. Uh, she said, he often comes up with his own ideas and helps the lesson flow. I mean, lots of them do, but you know, Tom always seems to be really willing and he loves to learn. He's very excited and exciting too. He really just helps to bounce things along. You know, children tend to bounce off him as well. He'll come up with an idea, his hand is always up. Uh, according to Mrs. Allison, he was amongst the most able children in the class. 
And that was actually the only challenge that she noted. Sometimes she found it hard in a big group to keep up with his ability and t to challenge him enough. Um, she also thought, she didn't use these words, but she also uh, gave me the sense that she liked him also because he was useful, he was predictable, and he was reliable. Useful. So she gave an example where she had, uh, um, they were doing a literacy lesson and she wanted to extend the grammar that she was teaching. And she wasn't confident about this activity, but if uh, uh, she, she did it, and actually it went quite well, and most of the children got it by the end of the, the, the section of the day. Um, but she did use Tom and another girl who was quite similar to Tom in many ways to help uh, to help her teach, really. He was almost, a, he didn't know it, but he was almost a teaching assistant. Because he got it, she could rely on him. He was useful, he was a tool, and then she could ask him to explain it to someone else, or she could ask him to come and do the example. So he became a, a kind of a, another teacher, almost, in the lesson. Um, when asked to reflect on the days that I'd spent with them, Mrs. Allison talks about some of the difficulties in her classroom. Uh, she found it difficult to keep up with a full and fast-paced curriculum with little um, extra, extra adult help, so she did not have a teaching assistant in her group. Uh, she did also have a, teaching, uh, a qualifying teacher in her class for one of the days too, so she, she was observing another teacher doing some of the teaching too. Um, uh, there was um, also um, evidence of, of uh, a kind of lack of teacher presence at times in their classroom. So um, there were 30 children, I think, um, and with mainly just one adult there, uh, a lot of time, kids were working on their own. They had no direct adult interaction, and that was, that was true of Tom as well. Um, the observation actually between, if uh, I mark down the number of interactions, direct interactions between Tom and Mrs. Allison, uh, and also made notes about the, the, um, the characteristics of those interactions, what they said to each other, what the purpose of the interaction was, what kind of interaction it was, that kind of thing. And there were actually quite a lot, more than in any other case between, uh, that I observed between, between this teacher and this pupil. Um, and actually they were, um, they were very, uh, in some cases, very sweet examples. There was one um, guided reading exercise. So uh, um, guided reading, are you familiar with this term? So you have a, all the children are reading the same book. Um, they take turns to read aloud and they pause and they discuss, that kind of thing. So um, Tom was doing a guided reading uh, in a group of five pupils uh, and the teacher was there. He, he was sitting next to the teacher, which was quite common. He would also, uh, always, when given the opportunity apparently, sit right next to Mrs. Allison. <laughs> And over the course of the, the period where they were working together, he would get closer and closer <laughs> to Mrs. Allison until at the end they were sort of, he was leaning on her or something like that. Um, so it was quite, quite touching, quite affectionate uh, in many ways. Uh, and they had some, some very um, sort of sweet uh, interactions. There was one uh, where they were discussing some words in the book and Mrs. Allison asked the group, alcoves, what are they? And Tom said, well, it's like a basement. Mrs. Allison said, and what is senile? And Tom said, gentle, which is the wrong answer. Uh, and other people said, strict. And Tom said, very old and needs looking after. Mrs. Allison, looking at Tom, said, probably not got all her memory. And Tom said, all her muscles. And then they had a bit of a giggle together. It was very sweet. Um, and then later, uh, um, in the same guided reading activity, um, they were talking about the meaning of the word sympathetically. And uh, she gently touched Tom's hand and said, well, for example, if you fall over, I might pick you up and put a plaster on it if you'd cut yourself. And it, so the, those little, act, little interactions between them, I think, were quite common. I saw, saw quite a lot of these. Um, but, uh, the, yeah, so I think many of the social interactions, so as I said, Tom sought out these interactions with his teacher and he used to get closer and closer to her, but he did this with uh, lots of his friends as well in the class. So there were lots of times when uh, they were supposed to be working individually and they weren't. <laughs> they were working in little, little groups of children and, and having a good chat. Um, and that seemed to be quite uh, something which Tom um, quite enjoyed. Okay, so case study number two. It's a little different. So this is Julie and Mrs. Connor. So Julie, we'll say, for example, is not, say, this child here on the end. And Julie, of course, is not her real name. 
and Mrs. Connor. So Julie was 10. Uh, and her school was very different from, from Tom's. Um, it was in a, Tom's school was a small primary school in a rural village. Uh, it had recently been um, in special measures, uh, but had made a dramatic improvement after partnering with the local secondary school. Uh, Julie and Mrs. Connor's school was quite different. Um, it was in a, um, a large town. Uh, it was much bigger, probably three or four times the size of Tom's school. Um, and it was in a very deprived part of town, so it served a quite a challenging community. Mrs. Connor was actively looking for a new job at the time of the uh, observation, uh, but I, th I think she had been quite she'd been quite a long term uh, long serving member of staff. Okay, so it was a mixed uh, year five and year six class. So that's the two final years of primary school were uh, being taught together because the school had had. Um, such a challenging history. This particular year group, I think, had been quite difficult, and a lot of the parents who could had removed their children from school. So they'd ended up with these two very small groups, which they'd then merged into one class. Um, so it was a, a, a little different. Um, the head teacher was relatively new to the school and had been brought in to turn it round, uh, and she described it as uh, having been a place where pupils didn't necessarily feel safe. Um, because there were no clear rules for behaviour and no clear structures for discipline previously. Uh, and I think that was changing at the time that I was there. Um, the story of Julie and Mrs. Connor to me was one about negotiating challenges. Uh, for Julie, these were predominantly about the complex social world of her classroom. And for Mrs. Connor, I think they were mainly about uh, the challenges of teaching a, a really um, diverse uh, and poorly integrated group. Um, in a drive um, to improve and offer a full and varied educational experience, it was a, this classroom was a really busy place. They were going off to trumpet lessons and uh, guided reading over here, and they were splitting up with, uh, merging with other classes to do phonics, um, revision, and that sort of thing. So it was, it was quite frantic <laughs> most of the time. Um, Uh, the the, uh, the room was very big. It was probably nearly half the size of this room, and there were uh, sort of only 21 pupils in the class. So they sat mainly towards the front of the group, um, close to the, uh, the teacher and the whiteboard and, and the interactive uh, whiteboard as well. Uh, the back of the classroom was just used for one-to-one -one work with the teaching assistants. Um, Julie ha um, had hearing difficulties, so she only had partial hearing in one ear and she sat on a particular table because it was easiest for her to hear. Uh, Mrs. Connor described Julie as needy and lacking in confidence in class and said she often required support to check that she'd completely understood an activity before she was willing to start to work independently. She said, you'll notice she's the one who comes again and again and again asking, is this okay, is this okay? Mrs. Connor also explained about Julie's hearing problems and asked me to observe and, and give her some advice on, on these hearing problems. I have no idea why she would ask me that. Um, uh, she also talked about some of the other issues and said that Julie um, uh, brought quite a lot of baggage into school. So she had quite a difficult home life, quite a difficult life out of school, and that sometimes impacted on her behavior in school. Uh, she explained she has lots of issues at home, lots of friendship issues within school. So we spend quite a lot of time talking things through and helping her see the way forward, I guess. In her first interview, Julie talked about her classmates and what sort of pupil she was. She referred to learning styles because uh, they talked a lot about this in class and said she was a listener and a looker. Uh, she also said that she loved working by herself when it's all quiet uh, but that her class talked a lot. Uh, she said she sat next to the biggest chatter in the class and she talks about anything. And it's good because she's my best friend. Uh, it's annoying because she talks a lot and goes, Julie, what's this? Because I wasn't listening. And then she has to stop her work and help. She also liked writing stories because she could use her imagination and all what comes from her brain, she said. Her favorite subject was science, but they didn't do much of that. And the subject she found most difficult was art, because the teacher don't tell us how to do it. When she talked about her relationship with Mrs. Connor, she focused on gaining help and permission uh, and associated this with her hearing problems. Um, she agreed that she did need the teacher's clarification before she was happy to start working. Uh, and actually, in her post-interview comments, she said um, she asked if I'd seen her go and ask Mrs. Connor 
for some clarification. And she explained that she brought her book right over to the teacher and said, should I do this? Because I don't think she explained it right. <laughs> so distractions were commonplace in the class. Uh, much of Julie's time in class seemed to be uh, about negotiating and balancing um, her social position in the group. And the group was quite difficult, actually. There seemed to be lots of different groups within the class. Uh, and Julie, um, just, she gave them names, so they were like the cool kids. Uh, and um, the, the cool kids uh, were actually the bullies, almost. Uh, and there was a number of other groups as well. There was a very um, quiet group of girls that sat in one particular part of the room, and they, they largely refused to work with anyone. There was one time when the teacher ordered people into pairs, and one of these girls refused to work with one of the more challenging boys. Um, and went and sat somewhere else and just completely ignored the teacher. Uh, the boy made obscene gestures at the girl and called her fat, and the teacher, uh, nothing happened. Um, and this was sort of fairly commonplace, I think. It, uh, while I was there, I saw lots of these kind of interactions between the pupils uh, and between the pupils and the teacher. Um, the Julie was seen actually most with the disruptive group, um, but was also able to talk to all of them. She she merged, sort of moved around the room quite quite freely and moved around the groups um, quite freely. Uh, she didn't ever volunteer, and she explained afterwards that um, she felt that it was most necessary to stay on the right side of the most disruptive children because they were the most dangerous. Uh, although she did actually like a lot of the other children, she actively chose to not work with them if she could avoid it. Uh, she also explained that she did get involved in, in bad behavior, in fights, and in being sort of mean to other people. Uh, and this was sometimes uh, because she was angry about something, but sometimes because there was a kind of social pressure to do this. That it was, if you didn't do this, you would then be excluded by the group that uh, could cause you the most, uh, most difficulties in, in school. So she spent a lot of her time, I think, sort of negotiating the social side of what was going on in the classroom. Um, okay, I'll pause there uh, and let you ponder briefly. I forgot my other. Uh, there was also, um, uh, um, uh, on the second day that I was there, uh, she, Julie arrived at school with her shoe was very badly broken, so that the heel, the, the sole of the shoe had fallen off, so she was having to walk very strangely to try and manage this. And the whole day, no adults mentioned this, nobody did anything. So I think, uh, I mean, they had other things to deal with. <laughs> there was a lot going on in the school. But um, perhaps uh, it, it's another, another thing that was observed. Um, so a couple of questions for you to think about. What do these stories make you think about in terms of quality from the perspective of the children and the teachers? So I'll give you just a couple of minutes to discuss that in your groups. Okay, I'll, I'll stop you there, just in the interest of time. I mean, these were my thoughts afterwards, but you may disagree. Uh, you may agree, I'm not sure. But for Tom and Mrs. Allison, I thought it was pretty easy being a good pupil. He was a good pupil. He had a pretty good life at school. Uh, and he was a real asset to his teacher, and I think that's both a positive and a negative in some ways. Um, uh, and the interaction between uh, him and the, the teacher was clearly really important um, to both of them and made both of them feel pretty good about their jobs. Um, I think this business about being good is, is great if you're good, but it also casts accidentally almost other pupils as bad, and, and that's not necessarily desirable. I don't know if that resonates with what you said, what you thought. I know, I know you didn't get to see it, but <laughs> um, the next one was Miss Julie and Mrs. Connor. I think uh, for me it really, I mean, it's a quite a sad story, and it was really, really quite a sad uh, case study to do. Um, but it really made me think that the, there's business about uh, classrooms being really social environments and the fact that that social environment can, for some children, have a massive impact on their ability to learn and the kind of choices they make about learning. So in Julie's case, she actively chose not to learn on a lot of occasions because it was safer and that was more important. And I think as a teacher, that's something uh, that we need to be aware of. Um, I think it also highlights, uh, I forgot to say actually, in Julie and Mrs. Connor's story, uh, over the course of a week there were five, only five direct interactions between Mrs. Connor and Julie, and all of them were very administrative. They were very much about clarifying instructions or moving people from one person, one place to another. There was nothing else. 
Uh, and, and there's all sorts of reasons for that, so I don't want to be judgmental against uh, Mrs. Connor or Julie, uh, but it, I think it's just, uh, it's a really extreme opposite to Tom and Mrs. Allison. Uh, and I think also it highlights that in many classrooms, and I don't know if this is the same in, in your context and, and where you teach, but um, the challenges um, and distractions are part of everyday classroom life. And sometimes that's minor and sometimes it's major. Uh, and that uh, gets in the way, obviously. But, um, okay, so moving on, I want to get, uh, we're running out of time, so I want to get into the, um, you know, how might you do this? You know, what are the tools that you might want to take away and, and have a go at? Um, so going back to this idea that we interview, we observe, and then we interview, um, and trying to kind of make it simple and relatively quick, uh, this is maybe what, what you can take away if, if you want to. Um, in the in, inter first interview with teachers, these are perhaps the kind of things you might want to, to discuss. Uh, if you're going to do this on yourself, then you, I guess these are the kind of questions you might want to reflect on. But I would probably suggest that this is best to do with a friend. So if you have the opportunity to discuss with another teacher to observe their practice and or ask someone to do this for you then that can be quite um, perhaps a more powerful way of doing it but I mean completely up to you so I mean it's pretty simple it's not rocket science this um, you know just asking about what you're working on if you want to focus I think it's easier to focus the observation on on one child or a small number of children rather than a whole group um, so focusing again in the questions about what you're working with on that with that child what kind of relationship what difficulties do you have how do, the, how do you think they fit into the class and what's their experience, kind of your, your um, understanding about that. The, for the child, the pre-observation uh, interview might be something along, you know, what they like about their teacher, what they don't like about the way they're taught, what they do like about the way they're taught, what they're doing, their awareness of what's going on in their classroom and what their teacher expects of them. Um, what they like and dislike about the day, uh, how the teacher helps them, and, and what extra support or teaching they would like to get but don't get. The observation, I mean, you won't be able to spend a whole week <laughs> probably observing, but maybe you can spend 10, 15 minutes or one lesson or a day, I don't know. Uh, whatever you can, the, the greater the amount of time, the more you'll see and the more you'll potentially understand. Um, and while you're observing, we'll have a go at this in a minute, uh, it's... Um, a case of noting down what you see uh, and looking um, for interaction that's taking place, describing it in your notes, uh, what you think the purpose of uh, the purpose of the interaction is, and is it obvious or not? Actually, sometimes you might need to mark, actually, this is not obvious, and I'm guessing, um, because you'll need to check that later. Uh, also, note down nonverbal interactions. That's also important. It's not just what they actually speak about. Um, dialogue uh, and examples, uh, because these are the... The, the, the bones of what you'll talk about afterwards. So this is what your template might look like. So I'll ask you to sketch this on a bit of paper in a moment. So just keep a, a, a note of the time on one side because that helps you to keep focused. Um, writing down your description, your notes in the, in the middle column, and then any reflections you have. So thinking about you know, your interpretation of quality, you can write, well, I think this is, is, this is where you're allowed to be really subjective and say, well, I think this is good, or I think this is bad, or I think I'm really shocked by this, this is really sad, you know, those kind of things you can go there because that's the column that you can check later. Um, afterwards, with both teachers and pupils, it's a case of going through your notes and saying, well, this is what I thought, am I right? And, and those kinds of things. Okay. So we're going to watch a video, um, if I can uh, make it work. Um, so this is um, a, a video that I've just taken off YouTube. Um, it's in the unfortunate position at the moment of doing a massive study which involves loads of video of classrooms, but I'm not allowed to share any of them. Um, so I've had to, to steal one off, off YouTube. Um, so I think just pick a pupil. I'd go for a pupil that is in reasonably good sight. Uh, and um, have a go at that, filling in those columns. So marking the time, just every couple of minutes, just to make sure you're noting something down. Uh, in the middle, describe the interactions, what's going on in the classroom, and then your reflections in the final column. And then we'll just do this for a few minutes, see what you come up with, and then uh, have a quick discussion about it afterwards. All right, you guys start with the strategy. That's the first step. Who can do it? 
Okay, good first step. Oh, 
Oh, well, are you done yet? Oh, oh, oh. all right, you guys got halfway there. You got halfway there, right? So you had 314 nickels, Ellen did. She gave 225 of them to Linda. How many nickels are left over? But the question is, how much money does Ellen still have? Does she have 89 cents or 89 nickels? All right, how much is 89 nickels? You might not have it right on here, but you can get it right on your whiteboard. All right, Sophia, I want you to try this out. Each nickel is worth how much? Five cents. Anyway, works for me. All right, you guys got it? Nicely done? Good, good. Journal pages. Whose is this? Uh, that's right, you're not sitting there. Okay, what was the first thing you guys did? It looks like you did 314 minus 225. What does that give you? Okay, I'm going to tell you, you guys did everything right. You're going to subtract and then multiply. You did that, but your subtraction, you made an error on. 314 minus 225 is not 91. Check that out. Check that out. Are you guys done? Yeah. Did you get it right? Yeah. Nicely done. Get on your math, math boxes. Good, good. Math boxes. Don't erase it. Don't erase it. Leave it off there. I want to see the work. Yes. I guess. Yeah. Get a little early. You have about one minute to finish this up if you're not quite finished yet. Alright, if you guys are done, go ahead and move your map boxes. You can just leave that journal out. I'll stop it there just in the interest of time. Um, if, just in your groups again, if you just compare those, um, take you back to the slides. Uh, so if you just compare notes, or you know, who did you look at? Which pupil did you choose? Um, and uh, did you have any difficulties with the task? Um, what did you write down? <laughs> uh, what do you think about this teacher? What do you think about this pupil based on what you saw or the experience of this pupil in particular? Um, what might you ask the teacher in the pre-observation and the, the post-observation interview and the same for the pupil as well? Um, and then uh, I'll give you just five minutes to do that and then we've just got one very small thing to do at the end. Okay, we're running out of time, so I'm going to stop you there, but uh, it's interesting to hear, hear your discussions. Um, and I think lots of you talking about uh, things which will lead you on to questions that you would clarify later with the teacher and with the pupil potentially. Um, but I think for most of you, it, it wasn't actually a difficult task to watch in this way is probably something which is actually quite familiar to you. So, I mean, take it, uh, take it away as an idea. If it's useful, please use it. Adapt it to, to fit um, however you, know, you think it might. Uh, and you know, perhaps, perhaps try it on uh, the unexpected pupils. So not the good ones, not the challenging ones, the other ones that often get uh, are invisible in, in our classrooms and in our schools and see if you can learn a little bit about them and how they're experiencing every day at school. Um, so thank you very much uh, for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay.